Greetings, my name is Philip Hanston. I'm a professor emeritus at the University of Washington in Seattle. My scientific field is drug interactions, but I also spend about half my time in philosophy. Today, we're going to talk about William K. Clifford, and I will try to screen share here so you can see the slides. There he is. Okay, uh, William, Clifford was, you can see, had a rather short life here. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, was a brilliant mathematician and philosopher, uh, British. Uh, it's not that uncommon, actually, to combine uh, philosophy and mathematics. Uh, it's, if you think about uh, Pascal, Descartes were world-class mathematicians and outstanding philosophers. Um, there's also, um, Leibniz, uh, who was a philosopher who was a co-inventor of the calculus. Uh, Bertrand Russell was an outstanding mathematical uh, logician. So there are many other examples of people who have combined mathematics and uh, philosophy. Now Clifford uh, was an outstanding student in both mathematics and the classics. So it kind of makes sense that he might be interested in philosophy. Uh, he also, a tidbit, he was uh, very good at gymnastics theoretically or according to story, he could do a one-handed pull-up, which is a pretty amazing feat. Uh, he was known for his brilliance and originality. He was a very original thinker in both mathematics and uh, in philosophy. Uh, he was a fun guy. He loved parties. Uh, he was very witty, told a lot of jokes. Uh, he loved to entertain children. He told them stories, etc. Unfortunately, he collapsed at age 30. Some people think overwork uh, contributed to it because he just worked all the time, he worked during the day and then into the night. And uh, perhaps because he was in weakened condition, he died a few years later from uh, TB. And if you hear noise in the background, uh, our 20-year-old Norwegian forest cat, Yoda, is uh, trying to weigh in, but I'm going to ignore him. Okay, uh, Clifford is buried in Highgate Cemetery in, uh, in uh, London. It's kind of a scary cemetery. Don't go there in the middle of the night. It's really, it's all overgrown and the tombstones are all falling over. There are some that are really well kept, like uh, this is Karl Marx. Uh, hit, no problem with that one. But it took a long time to find uh, William K. Clifford's tombstone. Uh, it was overgrown with, with uh, ivy, uh, had bird poop streaked down it. It was uh, askew. Uh, he actually deserves uh, way better than that. <clears throat> so, before we get to Clifford's best idea, which is the title of this uh, talk, uh, Clifford's, William K. Clifford's best idea, he also had a lot of really good ideas. And actually, mathematicians would probably claim these were his best ideas. But since I don't really understand all of this stuff, uh, we're going to focus on uh, one I'm going to talk about in a minute. But he was instrumental in starting geometric algebra. Uh, he also talked about the bending of space by gravity, which prefigured uh, some of Einstein's uh, ideas. Uh, also original ideas in philosophy of science. So he was a pretty brilliant guy in uh, mathematics. But for our purposes, um, and we'll, I'll leave it to the mathematicians to talk about that. Uh, for our purposes, I think his best idea is what I call, and this is just my, uh, my term for it, Clifford's Law. Uh, and Clifford's Law can be found in an essay that Cl Clifford wrote, and you can get this on the internet. Uh, I happen to have a, a book that has it in it, but you can also get it for free on the internet uh, called The Ethics of Belief that uh, was published at, pretty much at the end of his life in 1879. He tells a story, a hypothetical story of a ship owner uh, who has a ship that's about ready to leave for the new world uh, filled with people. Uh, he realizes that the ship owner realizes that the ship has some problems and probably ought to be inspected and repaired. Uh, but gradually he suppresses his doubts and comes to believe, sincerely believe that the ship's probably going to be okay. Uh, and that Providence will look over these, uh, these uh, emigrants. So he lets the ship go, the ship sinks in mid-ocean, everybody dies, but he gets his insurance money for the ship. So Clifford then asks this hypothetical story. He says, well, uh, what shall we say of him? Surely this, that he was verily guilty of the death of those men. And I think most people would agree with that. Most people could hear this story say, well, he obviously shouldn't have let the ship go. Um, and then you say, but why is he guilty? After all, the ship owner sincerely believed that the ship would make it across the ocean. So he had this sincere belief. Um, so doesn't that get him off the hook? 
And uh, Clifford goes on to say, he did sincerely believe in the soundness of his ship, but the sincerity of his conviction can in no wise help him because he had no right to believe on such evidence as was before him. And that's Clifford's emphasis. He had no right to believe on such evidence as was before him. So Clifford's not gonna let him off the hook on this because even though he sincerely believed it, he shouldn't have given the evidence. And if he'd really thought about the evidence objectively, he wouldn't have come to that conclusion that it was safe to send the, the ship. Um, but then Clifford asks a more difficult question. What if the ship made the voyage safely and many other voyages after that? Does that eliminate his guilt? And Clifford has a very rapid answer to that. Not one jot. When an action is once done, it is right or wrong forever. No accidental failure of its good or evil fruits can possibly alter that. And I think this is uh, a very important point that, that uh, Clifford is making. When an action is once done, it is right or wrong forever. And if you really think about this, take some time to think about that issue, um, it's kind of hard to argue against Clifford's claim. Now he does acknowledge that a lot of times we're not dealing with certainties. In fact, we're almost never dealing with certainties. We're dealing with probabilities. Same thing with the ship, letting the ship go. Uh, there are many cases, Clifford, Clifford says, there, uh, moreover, there are many cases in which it is our duty to act upon probabilities. All the, the evidence is not such as to justify present belief or to justify certainty is what he's saying there. Uh, and in fact, this is what we often do. And in, uh, in the health professions, we're often dealing with probabilities. If we do X, there's such and such a probability that Y will happen. Um, and this is something that we do frequently. Um, right or wrong forever. So let's uh, take another hypothetical. One man is bathing his infant and across town, another man is doing exactly the same thing with a similar infant. Both of them step out of the bathroom to take an important call from their boss. When they return, one baby is just splashing around in the water, having a good time, but the other one is drowned. Are they equally culpable? Uh, not legally, of course, but ethically, are they equally culpable? And uh, of course, the answer that Clifford would give is absolutely. They are absolutely ethically just as, uh, as guilty. Uh, both, both of these uh, men are just as guilty. Um, and with regard to uh, health professionals, let's say two pharmacists get a prescription for propafenone. This is a heart drug uh, in patients on another heart drug, digoxin. Uh, this one interacts with digoxin and can cause a, a serious increase in the digoxin levels. Both of them ignore the interaction and one patient's developed toxicity, uh, digoxin toxicity isn't hospitalized. The other person has no adverse effect. And this is typical. We can't predict ahead of time. In most cases, we know we're increasing the risk for the person, but we can't say this person is going to have dig toxicity and that person is not. Um, you just have to go on probability. So is one of the pharmacists more guilty than the other? From an, again, from a legal standpoint, absolutely. But from an ethical standpoint, Clifford says, no, they're precisely the same degree of culpability in both cases. Then he brings up another important point um, that you maybe have already thought of, uh, but says one, I'm a busy man I have no t or woman. I have no time for the long course of study, which would be necessary to make me in any degree a competent judge of certain questions or even able to understand the nature of the arguments. Then, Clifford concludes, he should have no time to believe. So it's fine if you don't understand climate science or if you don't understand the complexities of uh, economics or whatever, there are a million topics I don't have a good knowledge of, uh, then that's fine, but then you, have, you should have no time to believe from the standpoint of, of your own assessment of the situation. Now, Clifford, I'm sure would, he didn't discuss this much in his essay, but, uh, Clifford, I'm sure, would say, well, but if you have an expert that you trust, that you that that is truly an expert in a field, whether it's, uh, well, I don't know, economics, maybe not a good example, but let's say climate science or pharmacology or cardiology or uh, even a cook or a, or a car mechanic, it doesn't matter. If they're an expert in their field and they tell you a certain thing or a bunch of them tell you the same thing, then uh, you are justified in accepting their assessment because they're experts and they're trustworthy. So there are times when uh, you personally can't conclude, but you are justified in accepting the advice of, uh, of true experts, especially 
if it's an overwhelming number of experts who all say basically the same thing. So this brings up the issue that the philosophers call epistemic responsibility, which is just a fancy way of saying we have a responsibility to consider the evidence before us and use rational thought before we make a decision and try to be as objective as we possibly can. So uh, this is a responsibility. It reminds me of uh, a statement that uh, Pascal, Blaise Pascal made uh, hundreds of years ago. He said, let us work on thinking well. That is the principle of morality, Pascal. Let us work on thinking well. That is the principle of morality. Thinking well uh, can be a moral act. Now, we have this responsibility uh, to uh, make uh, this ep epistemic responsibility, but it doesn't necessarily apply to trivial decisions. Like if you're trying to decide what flavor of ice cream to get, um, now actually, you couldn't go wrong with these three, uh, in my view, just based on what they look like. Uh, this one, no, there's no excuse for vanilla ice cream, but that's another story. Uh, so for trivial decisions, no, you don't. You can go on whims for those. <laughs> uh, so basically Clifford is saying outcomes are irrelevant, not from a legal standpoint, of course, but outcomes from a moral or ethical standpoint are irrelevant. And again, not irrelevant to the person who's affected, but uh, from, a, from the decision-making, they are irrelevant. And here is my sort of summary of what I think is Clifford's law. Once an action is done or not done, because oftentimes it's failing to act, which is the problem. Once an action is done or not done, it is right or wrong forever. This is a really important concept. If you have considered the evidence carefully and objectively, and you have done your best, you can rest easy no matter how it turns out. Um, and this, I think, is um, something worth considering. And it's not just for momentous decisions that uh, Clifford's Law applies, uh, but it also in just everyday decisions. And this is one of the reasons why Clifford's Law is, in my view, one of the most useful uh, concepts in all of philosophy. I mean, from a standpoint of being useful on a regular basis, I use Clifford's Law probably every week, sometimes more often. And it's a, it's a very liberating thing. Now, the, the Hood Canal dilemma is something I, again, I made up. Uh, one time, uh, this is the Puget Sound area. One time uh, before we moved from the Seattle area down to the Bay Area in California, we were in Seattle. Seattle's right here. Here's Elliott Bay. We took a ferry that goes from uh, Seattle to Bainbridge Island. The, the terminal is right there. Got in our car that was parked there, drove up across the Agate Pass Bridge through Paul's Bow and up to the Hood Canal Bridge. Now the Hood Canal Bridge is that little red thing there, okay? Our house was right here. Now we had a dilemma because uh, we were going back. My wife had an, a very important meeting that she had papers at home that she had to look at during the meeting. It was about three hours from the time we arrived at this end of the bridge. The bridge was closed because the wind sometimes howls down this fjord. This is the Hood Canal here. It's not a canal, it's a fjord. Um, and they closed the bridge because it's a floating bridge and it's too dangerous. So we sat there. We knew, based on history, that the bridge was almost never closed for more than two hours at a time, just it, very rarely. So we figured we had at least an 80% chance that if we stayed there, uh, then the bridge would open and in five minutes we'd be at our house, which was right here. We'd almost see our house. Um, but the meeting was really important, and so we couldn't. Uh, so we, we decided that we'd better drive around, which takes uh, well over two hours. So we went from here, down here, down here, around the end of the, and up here. It's a pretty drive, but nonetheless. So just about the time we got halfway right here, uh, we looked at our cell phones while I was driving. My wife looked at her cell phone and realized that the bridge had opened, and that we would have we would have been much better off if we'd stayed there. But we made, I immediately said, Clifford's Law, she's tired of hearing me say this, we made the right decision. We calculated that it was really important that she get there and it just is possible we, uh, the bridge would have stayed closed. So we made the right decision. And I knew as soon as we started driving that we might need to invoke Clifford's Law. So instead of being upset that we had made the wrong decision, we knew that we had made the right decision. We continued on, made it uh, home, which was right here, with uh, plenty of time for her to get ready for her uh, phone meeting. So another example, practical example, um, we moved from the Seattle area down to uh, the north of, of San Francisco uh, in early 2017. And you may be 
aware that in the fall of 2017, we had a huge fire. So we enjoyed uh, the vineyards and the oak trees and the beautiful sunny weather. Uh, and then we were out of town uh, in October of 2017 and uh, we heard there was a huge fire. And when we got back, our Volvo uh, was a, a bit worse to wear for the, <laughs> for the fire. Even a Volvo can't, can't withstand a, an exploding gas tank. So our apartment, that we were living in at the time uh, did not burn down, thank goodness, but uh, it came very close, came within feet of our uh, apartment. Uh, so people have said, well, aren't you sorry you moved to California, uh, given that uh, there are all these fires? And since then, we've had more fires. And uh, the answer is no. We carefully, we took months and months to consider where we wanted to move from Seattle. We considered all the climate and what was nearby, et cetera, and decided that uh, this was the, we made a very rational uh, decision based on what we liked, et cetera. Um, and the fact that we ended up coming right before fire started, uh, for, from a Clifford's Law standpoint, we still made the right choice. And we're glad we, uh, you know, despite the fires, it's a wonderful place to live. Um, we're still swimming in, it's late November and we're still swimming in the outdoor pool. We have to reserve uh, a slot because uh, of COVID, but nonetheless, we're still swimming. So that part we like. But we also, I have to say, miss, very much miss the, the beauty of Seattle. It's such, such a beautiful uh, area. This, for many years, several professors, uh, uh, our fellow professors got together on a kayak trip uh, on December 31st every year. And sometimes it was spectacular. This was near Port Townsend in, um, in, the, in the Seattle area. And uh, it was one of those days where the water was just glass smooth. And the, it, we still had to bundle up, of course, but it was just a, a, a magical day. So we missed, there are many things we miss about Seattle, but we're still glad that, uh, that we moved. So finally, before we conclude, Clifford's Law applies to even sort of trivial decisions like picking a vacuum cleaner. Let's suppose that uh, your vacuum cleaner broke, you gotta get a new one. So you do a reasonable amount of research, you read the reviews, you look and see how much they cost, et cetera. And you decide to pick this, uh, this particular vacuum cleaner. Uh, again, it makes no difference then if it happens to be a lemon because you, you went through your due diligence in, uh, in trying to research it as best you could. Now you don't spend months and months and spend hundreds of hours researching this, you spend a reasonable amount of time. And then if, it, if it's a lemon, so what? Clifford's Law says you did, you did the right thing anyway and then you just move on, you get a new one or whatever you do. So it's, it's very useful uh, for little small practical decisions like picking a vacuum cleaner as well.